It was my honor last year to be able to give Hank Lavin that award at the, at the honors um, event hosted by the President Vivian Gaston last year. At that time, I recounted the amazing and extraordinary six decades of work that he's done. I'm not going to do that this morning. I would remind you that we are um, awarding someone who's done more than 20 books. Oh, I can't imagine having to do 20. Uh, I'm tired of the ones I've done. Among them, ones we know very well, the price we pay, cost effectiveness, privatizing educational choice, and many, many others. Hank has an um, interesting um, title of being named by New York Times in 1992 as one of nine national leaders in education innovation. And I think that's an extraordinary accomplishment. He's the William H. Kilpatrick Professor of Economics and Education at TC, and co-founder of the Center for Benefit Cost Studies of Education. He also holds emeritus status at Stanford University. Hank is going to be talking this morning about cost effectiveness in education, mysteries, and revelations. I tried to get him to give me a preview of what he was going to talk about and how it would relate to his ongoing work, but he was too busy listening to jazz last night. <laughs> but he's awake this morning. What I'd like to do is to uh, give him the opportunity to share his work, his thoughts, his ideas. I'd like to um, save at least 20 minutes at the end so that you can engage back and forth with him in conversations. He'll moderate those himself, and I will sit at the table and be your timekeeper. Welcome, Hank, and congratulations. Well, thank you very much. If I get too excited, warn me, because one has to be very careful in this position this is a platform, and very, with very little space behind me, there's a precipice, we would say, okay? And uh, so warn me the cliff, and I'll go the cliff, okay? Um, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate it. It's a Sunday morning, and this is not the sizzling topic, you know, on the top of most conversations at AERA. In fact, let me just go a little bit farther. I looked in the index of, for the AERA program, and um, how many sessions even have the word cost in the title? Well, we would never know because there's not even a, a heading in the index. With all these pages and the density, uh, nothing on cost, okay? So, I'm starting off on the assumption this is going to be a very arcane subject and um, proceeding forward. Now, when I was told that I was both honored but obligated to give a talk this year, I said, how, how do I do that? What is the theme? And they said, well, the theme is to talk about your experience over a long career with research. And I thought, it's not going to work for me. And the reason is that I am one of the more eclectic persons. As If I'm curious about something, I work on it. Um, because I want to know. I mean, it's a very selfish reason, isn't it? Because I want to know. I want to understand. So I thought what I would do is just start at the beginning, five minutes, no more than that, talking about the different topics that I've been concerned with, and I'm not going to list them, uh, I've, I've put them in kind of general categories. Before 1968, I was at the Brookings Institution as an economist, and my field was government finance, and it was that experience that got me into the economics of education. Uh, between 68 and 75, I began to study educational productivity and equity. By then, I was at Stanford University. Uh, I shifted from there, continuing to do some work, as you'll see, but at the same time, I was really concerned about democracy in the workplace, democracy in the kind of institutions that we experience in our daily lives. And there's a well-known political scientist, Carol Pateman, who makes the argument that unless we have 
democracy in our daily lives, it's not going to function very well as we get more abstract through so-called representative democracy. It's something that has to be practiced. And I became engaged in that. Um, from 1985 to 2000, I did become engaged in that in a school finance movement, accelerated schools, I'm sorry, school reform movement. And um, over this entire period, even through today, I have been preoccupied with cost effectiveness and benefit cost analysis in education and school choice. On the educational productivity and equality, I just want to mention some, some of the products. In other words, we're, I'm not gonna talk about most of this, but we had a book on schools and inequality quite early based on work begun in the late 60s, community control of schools, which was something I became curious about because it was happening in Washington, D.C., which is where I was located, and so I had to get to that school, the students, uh, the teachers, others running it, to explain to me and to witness how communities would be involved, and you have to remember in those days, our black citizens were locked into their neighborhoods, it hasn't changed a lot, locked out of City Hall, and that's changed a bit. And so community control seemed the only direction to uh, address the needs of their children. I began to do some work on benefit cost analysis, cost of the nation of inadequate education for the Select Committee on Equal Educational Opportunity. In 75 to 85, that was workplace democracy and education. I continued to do some of the other things, but uh, I was really concerned, and you could say worker cooperatives in America, it's a fascinating topic, and you see the reality of democracy and ownership of the workplace and how it affects the people who are involved. And then schooling and work in the democratic state, which was a kind of larger canvas that I did with Martin Carnoy. The accelerated schools, I would have to say that this was the most inspirational part of my career. We had more than a thousand schools in 41 states dedicated to providing gifted and talented education to all students academic enrichment as opposed to remediation through research, arts, community, and personal projects building on strengths. And I'm sad to say that this was displaced in 2001-2002 by NCLB, which went in a very different direction and had the power, in a sense, to mold uh, behavior in that direction. So cost effectiveness and benefit cost analysis in education, I've been involved in six, six, and since 1968. And as, as you'll see, I, I actually wrote the first article on cost effectiveness in education in the Journal of Human Resources. Now, now those of you who worry a lot about whether I'm gonna be able to finish this talk because of age, I, I don't want to emphasize this, but that was written in 1970. So it was written quite a while ago. I was already pretty much into my career. And um, then I began to apply it more generally to education. As I've mentioned, doesn't seem to have taken off yet after, what is it, 47 years or something like that, because I haven't even been able to get it into the index in the fat book that you were given on the program of AERA in 2018. So 1970, 2018, 48 years, isn't it? Okay. But we do, we, I, I guess because we, I and my colleagues, and I have wonderful colleagues, care about this and like to think about applications and, and how to do them and how to explain them. Um, we have just produced our third edition of our overall work on the topic. And I'll get back to that. So l let me try to answer some very basic questions. What is cost effectiveness? Well, most evaluations of educational interventions focus on 
effectiveness. And yet, when we talk to people in the field who have to use the results of educational research, they're very concerned about the issue of cost, not only overall, whether their institutions can afford programs, but does the program provide good value for the kind of investments that must be made? And what we've found over this long period, at least for me, it's a long period of time, 48, almost 50 years, is that among alternatives with similar levels of effectiveness, there are wide differences in costs. You know, if you go to the What Works Clearinghouse, which we like and which we use, there's virtually nothing useful on costs. Um, we, we can talk about that later, we'll have time for questions. I don't think, again, that it's anything nefarious. It's just that it appears that that's another topic, you know, for the bean counters, that those boring people who seem not to care about substance. Uh, some, some of you know Frank Newman. Frank Newman was the president of Education Commission of the States, and he would always introduce me as Hank Levin, an economist, and then he would add to that he didn't have the personality to be an accountant. I think I do have the personality to be an accountant, but maybe not the kind of accountant you want to work with, okay. Um, so cost effectiveness analysis compares the cost of alternatives for achieving a given result. Now this is really important because a lot of people when I bring up cost, at least the users say, oh yeah, you're looking for the cheapest program. No, sometimes what appears to be the most expensive program is actually the program that you would want to consider because it gets very, very large effects relative to its cost. And it turns out that that's a much better investment in education than ones that simply have low costs or ones that simply have high effect sizes, okay? So why is it important? Well, I've just tried to explain why it's important. There might be large differences in cost among alternatives with similar effectiveness. In studies of the What Works Clearinghouse that we did on early literacy and dropout prevention, we found variations sixfold and more in costs for attaining given results in, in those areas. And so by choosing more cost effective programs, resources can be saved and used for new initiatives or to enhance other interventions. Now, I want to warn everyone, if you're not aware of this already, that we are now in a situation where things do not look good for education and state local expenditures. In 2015, more than half of the states were still spending less on K-12 education than they were just prior to the recession in 2007. If we look at education as a proportion of state local budgets, it has dropped and continues to drop. It was 26% of state local in 1977, and it's 22% in 2015, and I understand it's even lower today. In the last three decades, you know, you could say, where is the money going? State local spending on prisons has risen at three times the rate of pre-K to grade 12. And some of you may be aware that the present uh, so-called new tax reform, we could talk about what reform means in that context, um, it restricts state local tax deductions to $10,000. This means, um, from all taxes, by the way, in New York, we have New York City tax, we have a state tax, we have a sales tax, we have an income tax. So, you know, we've run the gamut. Uh, and tax burdens in the middle class of more than $10,000 are very, very common, but there will be pressure on taxpayers because if we do fund education properly, that is going to bring a lot more people above 10,000. So in general, we can anticipate downward pressure on spending for education. 
And finally, there are other, uh, other situations out there that are threatening. States are facing serious underfunding of the pensions, and including teachers' pensions, and rising demands from an aging demography, okay? So the first thing to know about this cost-effectiveness analysis is it's not only found in the uh, program of the AERA, but it's rarely done in education. Um, usually the effectiveness results are reported with no attempt to estimate cost. And even when it's done, it's done poorly. And I, I love borrowing from my former colleague, Lee Shulman, who was concerned about aptitude treatment interaction, the idea of having different treatments for students with different aptitudes within the same classroom setting. Very challenging, uh, very challenging kind of situation. And he said, effectiveness is measured with calipers, but he, he, he actually didn't talk about, he was talking about aptitude and treatment. I've translated that to effectiveness is measured with calipers, but costs are me measured with a witching rod. And I think that's very accurate uh, picture of what we're talking about. So why aren't costs measured? Well, we could ask the contributors to the AERA program, but I think the most important reasons, there are a lot of them, um, evaluators are focused on effectiveness simply effectiveness. And it assumes that costs are easily known, so why worry about it? Or that they're accessible from traditional school counting systems, and I put in parentheses, they're not. And that schools focus then more on overall budgetary constraints, you know, do we have enough to cover um, the, the available resources without going back to taxpayers, without getting state legislation, than they are on the cost of specific alternatives, specific programs. So, uh, second area is that cost effectiveness is not understood. There are no demands for cost effectiveness comparisons by school boards or state authorities. So it's not even on the consciousness of people who make those decisions, most of them anyway. It's not taught in evaluation courses. We've looked at over, I, I believe it's 15 prominent institutions that have evaluation programs in education, and I believe only two of them even really mentioned that, and they tell you to read a kind of a sanitized chapter on the topic. Sanitized, because we don't want everybody to become boring like accountants, right? Okay, uh, cost effectiveness is used in education as a rhetorical term. When you hear the term cost effectiveness, or I have a cost effective program, or the program that I'm trying to sell you, um, excuse me, that I'm trying to mark, no. The program that I'm trying to tell you how valuable it is, is also cost effective. Now what does that mean? Well, as we found, it's a specific it's, it's used to sell specific reform without providing evidence. That is, it, it has a good sound to it. It's cost effective. It's, we like claiming we're parsimonious in terms of doing noble deeds, okay? Bill Kloon did a study in which he evaluated the ERIC database and found more, at that time, more than 9,000 documents under the identifier cost effectiveness. He selected 541 papers at random with this identifier and tried to find out what it was that they did to draw that conclusion and to make it a key word, an identifier of their particular document. And he found that more than 80% simply used the term to market or praise a favored intervention. That's how it's used in education. At the other end of the spectrum, less than 2% of papers attempted any cost effectiveness evaluation, even a flawed one, even a flawed one. So we're not saying that these were pristine. Now, one of the challenges of cost effectiveness is that it requires similar metrics of effectiveness. And it's challenging to even take effect sizes on, for example, different 
different measures of reading and to put them seriously into cost-effectiveness analysis, I would go farther. I would say to put them into an effectiveness analysis. So what we look for when we look at alternatives for particular goals are we look for similar metrics of effectiveness. And you could just name the, the different dimensions. These are only examples, test scores in the same subject, graduation rate, student satisfaction. You can come up with the criterion that you have, but we do want to measure some kind of similar yardstick in terms of the effectiveness side. Um, I also encourage you to look at some studies that we have on our website, uh, which is www.cbcse.org. We've done studies in computer assisted instruction, peer tutoring, class size, length of the school day, dropout prevention, early childhood literacy, social emotional learning, lectures versus small group instruction, ed tech, vouchers, adolescent literacy, and, and so on. Now, on the cost side, we have to use proper cost measurement. You can't just go into John, you know, with the visor and the little green hat and the quill and the pen who's ciphering numbers and say, John, what is the cost of Wilson reading? Because John isn't going to even have a clue of how to figure that out other than to ask Wilson reading what it charges per student. Well, if you want to look at costs, what you have to do is look at all the ingredients required to deliver the effectiveness results. And that includes training, it includes personnel, it includes a lot more than Wilson reading will sell to you for its program. So we call this the ingredients method. We first proposed it in the early 70s. And fortunately for us, it's been adopted by at least some of the more serious uh, organizations concerned with cost and cost effectiveness. For example, the World Bank now uses the ingredients method. Um, the JPAL, that's the Poverty Center at MIT, uses it for its looking at the costs based on uh, randomized control trials. Um, National Research Council has recognized it as the principal uh, cost method for doing this kind of work. Basically, what we do is we ask this question. We say, okay, you got this result. Let's say it's a randomized control trial. And we say, then, what did it take to get that result? What had to be present in order to get this result? What ingredients? And we then, that doesn't tell you anything about value. To understand the value of those ingredients, what we do is we use market prices or we use something called a shadow price as estimated by economic methods. Um, all of this is premised on the conceptual framework for opportunity cost, which is central to economic cost. The ingredients method starts off with the goal of the intervention. We don't just start off in saying, oh, what do the numbers tell us? In fact, you can't even figure out what ingredients must be in place in principle unless you start off with the goal of the intervention, the theory of action, the mechanism within the theory of action that makes a difference, and then the specific process. So we're talking about education there. We're not talking about costs at all. And we feel that that's a very important part for estimating costs. Then what we do is we specify the ingredients required to produce the effectiveness result that was found. And we set out details in various categories, personnel, facilities, equipment, materials, other inputs, client requirements. And these actually don't require any un understanding per se of how to measure costs. What they do require is careful study of what the intervention was, how it worked out, how it was actually implemented. And there's a lot of attention to qualities. For example, to say four teachers, that's not very helpful. We want to know the skills of the teachers and not just artificial qualifications such as a degree, 
which tells you very little about the skills. Now, do we always get fine-grained data on everything? No, we, we do the best that we can, but we are concerned about these and we make an effort to get qualitative information. And here I want to say something really good about qualitative researchers, and that is we need them. What we need is for, let's say, randomized controlled trials or other kinds of applications of particular interventions, we need a good real-time understanding of what the actual intervention was. Not the theoretical one that you find in psych articles or things of this sort telling us the underlying theory and what people are supposed to do and everything. It ain't supposed to do. It's what do they actually do? What actually happens? And we feel that that needs a good practiced eye. But at the same time, it's a big advantage for us because it identifies the actual ingredients that were used. We can actually look then at the qualities and skills of the people who were involved and come closer to what implementation meant than if we simply have some theoretical list or someone says, oh, it requires a few teachers, a counselor, this, some training, it's, that's not very helpful at all, even though the intentions are very good. Now, for most of our studies, I have to admit, we haven't had that advantage. We're pushing it right now. Uh, we're asking IES to really push it with us. We, we've, we've done a paper on guidelines that came out of our IES project and that's one of the guidelines we would like to see, the simultaneous collection of data on what happened, what was the actual intervention, what were the details, and at the same time, what were the specific ingredients that were used to, to accomplish this. But many of our present reports are retrospective studies based on the past, that is, someone found large effect sizes and now we go back and we say, what happened? <laughs> uh, how can we do a cost analysis of this? And so in those cases, we use reports, periodic observations of extant programs. If, if the programs are still running, a lot of times they're not, by the way. You get great results. Uh, <laughs> and what you find is what Works Clearinghouse talks about an evaluation that took place relatively long ago. and. Uh, there have been changes in the program. It, it may be extinct rather than extant, but um, even when it's there, hopefully programs improve. We learn something. And so it's not exactly the same as that which produced the results that are in, our, uh, in, in, in the effectiveness stable, so to speak. And we also go to interviews with knowledgeable staff and that can work out well, but memories fade, you know, and pretty dreams will rise up. And so sometimes we get the dreams as opposed to the reality. So we're, we're very good at sniffing out those kinds of issues in the retrospective studies. The big principle here is no ingredient is free. All ingredients have cost, no matter who provides them. And it's very common in education for people to say, oh, well, we didn't have to pay for that facility. The health department provided it, so it was free. Well, it wasn't free to someone. If we want to look at a situation where it wasn't provided, then the cost has got to be included. So we separate out two distinct uh, phases. One is we want to know all the resources, we want to know them well enough that we can get accurate prices, values on them, and then we can get the full cost of an intervention, the cost per student, so on and so forth. But separately from that, we can ask the question of who pays for it or who paid for it. And there are a lot of entities, different government agencies, philanthropists, uh, volunteers, so the objective is really to determine the total value of the ingredients that produce the effectiveness results. 
And, and here's something that we've seen quite often. Um, there are, for example, reading programs where they enlist personnel to keep reading groups down at 15 or below and to get 90 minutes a day of instruction. I think you're all likely to be familiar with some of those. And they see that as free because they're simply borrowing resources from other programs in the school, resources that could be used, or getting a social worker paid through, let's say, Title II or, or something of this sort. So they assume that's free and they come in with very, very low cost estimates, which you'll find are not, um, have not been well measured or understood. And so we are concerned with the cost of all resources, but we can do a separate analysis of who actually pays for the resources. And we have a cost spreadsheet. I don't want you to worry about this, but it shows how, how we actually do things. Now, this was designed, I think, in 1973. And so we had a lot of luck because it's a standard spreadsheet, Excel or whatever, can be done really quickly. And the good news, uh, by the way, it can answer both of those questions. Uh, what are the cost of the resources, specific categories if you want, and it can also answer who paid for the resources because what we do is we divide it according to um, different entities. More recently, we've produced software. I'm not selling you anything, because you can get it free. All you have to do is fill out a licensing form saying, basically, you're not going to commercialize it for some company or something. And we not only encourage you to get the license, but um, to, to, to use it to do this kind of work. Uh, there are presently more than 1,550 licensees, so that number is a uh, classic example of my w wonderful typing skills, okay? But 1550 is more accurate. And the details can also be found at our website. That's the uh, website for the Center for Benefit Cost Studies in Education, all those, those initials. Okay, now we've got to go to the effectiveness side, so what how do we do that? Well, we seek experimental and quasi-experimental studies of effectiveness, which was something that we really couldn't do in 1970, or even in the 1980s, or much of the 90s. But we can do t today, and we can evaluate the studies themselves in terms of their qualities, and in terms of at least their internal validity. And we seek validation of effectiveness, in other words, if there's anything we can say about generalization through multiple trials or methods, which go across different places, different demographies, and so on and so forth. And we do use what works clearinghouse, but we use it with our own uh, criteria and, and guidance. And in a few cases, we've pursued our own effectiveness studies. Okay, now the earliest study in the literature was, was something that I just, hit upon in 1970. And even at that point, when I went to Stanford in 68, no one knew what I was supposed to do, an economist in the School of Education. So I had to figure out what I was supposed to do. And one of the areas, I would say the main area, was to bring cost effectiveness into education. And I anticipated within 10 years, I would be super successful and everyone would be using it. Here we are almost 50 years later, and we can't get it into the AERA catalog, okay? Um, and so basically what we did is we used Coleman data. Coleman data were very fresh at the time that we were doing this <coughs> um, study being done in 68. The Coleman report came out in 66. To compare a strategy of selecting teachers with higher verbal scores versus <coughs> teachers with more experience. That is, if we have something in our resource base to hire better teachers, which should we prefer? Um, where did the effectiveness come from? We ran uh, production functions on sixth grade student achievement that had teacher characteristics, had school characteristics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And 
the cost was from running something called an earnings function. An, an earnings function looks at the intersection of supply and demand on the different characteristics of workers and what the so-called equilibrium price is. So this is what we did. It's exam an example of a shadow price. That is, you could not find, if you went to all the school districts in the Philadelphia region, this was done for a metropolitan area, Philadelphia region, you could not find, oh, well, for verbal score, we pay this much more. Um, and it wouldn't be meaningful anyway, because you may, for higher verbal s score teachers, they may be very different than lower verbal score teachers. The same was true with experience. At the experience increment, which did exist, um, was not necessarily the one that maintained the quality of teachers. That is, you may over time get more experienced teachers with lower skills in other areas because they're attracted away from teaching. You're not paying enough. You're not providing enough of an incentive for that particular characteristic. So uh, I show you, and I'm just terrible at taking charts, you know, and putting them on uh, PowerPoint. But, but basically, this, this tells us the relative cost of increasing student verbal achievement. We, all, we also did it on math. And the, it shows the approximate cost for increasing a student's verbal score by one point. Uh, I use the, the word Negro, which was, comes directly from the Coleman report. This comes from the article at the time. We could say black students, white students, whatever both misnomers in terms of color, but anyway. Um, what we found was that the effect of teacher's verbal score was basically the same in terms of its cost. So it could be equally helpful to both groups, but notice something else. Look at teacher experience. It cost only half as much for the amount of teacher experience that would improve the test scores of blacks as it did of whites. And that also gives a nice hint because it tells us that in a given stock of teachers with experience, prefer more experience for our black students. That's a good cost effective decision. So this is how you can use this kind of information. Now this was in 1970. It was based strictly on a multiple regression, which today is called an observational study without causal inference. We think it probably does have some causal inference. See Doug Wilms laughing out there and <laughs> saying, oh, did you use pencils and yellow paper to do this? But um, So what I want to do is say, well, What's next? Well, we did a number of studies, hopefully, as we master the technology, uh, increasing in terms of their usefulness. And um, I wanted to talk about nation at risk. We still talk about it, you know, and my God, how many years is that now? So someone quick arithmetic. But um, if you go back and read that report, it, it wasn't quite the profound analysis of what was happening in education that it was thought of as at the time. It was taken very seriously. But interestingly enough, it just made lists of reforms that were needed, or simply spoke of them in the context of uh, how we would become more internationally competitive and uh, would not just unilaterally disarm in education. Um, they were all needed, there was no preference, no priority, and the ones that did seem to get ballast, so to speak, in terms of how the states responded were graduation requirements, particularly at the high school level, more math, science, foreign language, longer school days, longer school years, more use of technology. Uh, they didn't have effectiveness results. The legislatures didn't no one really did. And so they just passed laws because this was a very influential report. So we decided 
let's do a cost effectiveness analysis on something to see um, what seems to work and be cost effective. And uh, we found some evidence in four areas. Uh, at that time, the class size was not the, was, was not the um, star experiment in Tennessee, which hadn't been completed and fully published or anything like that. Uh, but Gene Glass had done a meta-analysis, which was quite interesting, and worked out a logarithmic function that one could relate to class size based on the data. Uh, increasing the length of the school day. Some of you will remember that time and learning was big time in the 80s. And so there were actually quite a few studies. I think David Berliner, you were involved in, in some of those. Uh, and uh, of course, there were issues in education of whether within a time period, how much is due to is allocated to instruction, whether the retinas of the eyes are following the action in the classroom, all kinds of things, you know, because we create an industry for ourselves as researchers. But there were a number of studies that tried to look at the effectiveness of um, just an increase in time. Then there was computer assisted instruction, and one could argue that it was a ver very primitive at that time. It was, in fact, across the country, the most important application by far was drill and practice. But we had a real evaluation, experimental evaluation that most people aren't even aware of, done with educational testing service and the Los Angeles Unified School District. I, I really encourage you, those of you who are interested historically, to look at it because it dealt with dosage, it dealt with t subjects, again, in, in the earliest years, as with the Tennessee class size. And then finally, um, because of Ben Bloom largely, tutoring had become very, very central. And there were a number of uh, experimental designs used to look at tutoring, and one of the most attractive was in Boise, Boise, uh, Idaho. Okay, so we used actual data from those, and um, th this is the annual cost per student per subject, math reading. Um, in, math in mathematics, now, if you look at these numbers, you'll see some very interesting things. The first, let, let me jump, go to, down to the bottom, tutoring. Tutoring, the adult component's very expensive. You're paying adults salaries. They've given number of students. It's very, very high. You have to remember that um, this was, <coughs> the, the, the costs were estimated in the middle 80s and 827 per student was a great deal. I mean, it's worth a lot more than, than, than it would be today. So don't, don't settle in on the, these as the actual costs today if we were to replicate this. The peer component was less, but notice two aspects of the peer component. Now, a lot of people say, sure, students are free. Well, first of all, it depends upon the age of the tutors. But more than that, peer tutoring does not work without selection, training, a whole number of requirements. It has to be very well planned and it has to be very well administered. So what does this mean? It means it's not only kids, cross age, fifth graders, tutoring, second graders. It means that there are adults present who are involved in the training, in monitoring, in all, all of these other things. And that was the case in Boise. So notice something. Um, Nation at Risk thought that technology was such that everything using technology would be cheaper, but the peer component of tutoring was about twice as much as the CAI, as the computer assisted instruction. Um, increasing instructional time, that was increasing attention to each of those two subjects by a half hour or a total of one hour a day. And then we have reducing class size. And interestingly enough, if we look at 
the effect sizes of all of these, including the reducing class size, so we go from 35 to 20. There, there's, again, my typo. 35 to 20, that are, is a reduction of 15. That's not, <clears throat> not terribly different than you get in um, STAR in Tennessee class size. And the effect size, those are effect sizes to the right, are really comparable. This is from the glass analysis to the results of Tennessee class size. Um, so it turns out that though that these are the costs, I'm sorry, the, the um, effect size per equal costs. Now notice that the peer component of tutoring really had a very, very powerful effect. Kids, tutoring kids, but again, they, they may have been highly selected. Uh, we don't know how much supervision. We wish we had qualitative researchers there who could really document that, but you don't find it in any of the documents. And so we concluded that paradoxically, a recommendation that was not in the Nation at Risk report, peer tutoring cross age, was apparently a very desirable direction to go relative to computer assisted instruction, reducing class size, increasing, ins increasing instructional time. Uh, the increasing instructional time had very, very low effects relative to costs. The, you know, you find them in the data, but when, when you look at costs, they're not there. So here, here are the cost effectiveness of the uh, ratios of the four, and interestingly, the combined peer and adult program is about 0.22. Um, the peer component, 0.34, and adult component, 0.07. So big difference in favor of students. Computer-assisted instruction, th this is across both subjects math and reading, and that's only to get some concision here. It's not the way you'd want to analyze the data, but uh, computer-assisted instruction is basically half, uh, has half the cost effectiveness of the peer component. And the others are just way, way down the list, and, and they're very, very small relative to, for example, the peer tutoring. Um, Okay, so I, I've already given you these comments, the reducing class size and lengthening school day of low cost effectiveness. Um, the adult tutoring has a high effect size, but it's costly. CAI has a modest cost or had a modest cost at that time and a modest effect size. Peer tutoring, high cost uh, because it needs training and adult supervision. It, it wasn't really high cost for the students, but a much higher cost than you might expect if you said, oh, well, it's, it's costless having students uh, tutor students. And then, um, interestingly enough, at, at that time, and this was um, well after Apple II, you know, so we were using uh, microcomputers by this time. The, um, as I recall, the Apple II came out in 1982. This report came out in 83. We were looking at data that covered some of the earlier period, but went later. And um, the cost effectiveness of peer tutoring was double that of CAI. Okay. Now, we've done a lot of studies on uh, graduation, on increasing high school graduation. And um, here, I'm just going to give you an example, a comparison of two programs. And one of them, we've already mentioned, class size reduction. Um, that's the STAR program. And the other is a reform program that's not atypical of what is being done in high school. It's personalization, it's following students, it's keeping class size down at a reasonable level, usually 25 or fewer, it's getting teachers involved and in working with families um, and instructional improvement efforts. 
And um, this was done, by the way, this evaluation by MDRC. We, we did not do it. Uh, and the class size, as, as you know, was done by a group of, of excellent researchers and has been evaluated in a lot of ways. Um, and what we show is the number of additional high school graduates you would get out of at-risk groups if you were to use the intervention, our, our, our estimate. So first things first, it's 16, class size reduction 11. What's interesting about the class size reduction is if you look at the changes in test scores in the early grades where the intervention was applied, um, most of it is kindergarten, some in first grade, but it, it doesn't seem to be sustained. But then when you look at high school, the students who had the highest dosages, meaning four years of reduced class size way early in their uh, school careers, had substantially higher test scores in five subjects, including science, including other subjects that were, were not covered, and among the so-called at-risk students had uh, much higher high school graduation rates, okay? Now, the thing is, we're not looking at the overall graduation rate. Let's bear in mind that a certain proportion of the population would be predicted to graduate anyway. And we're concerned with the additional graduates one gets uh, as a result of the intervention. Uh, I also might point out to you that uh, the differences in cost. If we look at cost per student, and this is over multiple years, it's not in one year, um, it's about $5,500 per student more for uh, first things first than business as usual, the, the, count, the uh, counterfactual. If we look at class size reduction, um, it's 13,100. That zero really belongs in that column, but we squeezed it out for some reason and it didn't get there, okay? So it's much more, and part of that is due to the fact that it takes place much earlier. It takes place in K123, and the way we do the analysis, what we do is we have to wait more heavily earlier. This is just a financial aspect. We have to wait more heavily earlier investments than later investments. Later investments are reduced by a so-called discount rate, and high school is pretty late. Class size um, reduction is, in this particular uh, experiment, is very, very uh, early. And so if you look at the cost per, let's call it saved, that is an additional graduate, it's two and a half times as great through CSR as it is through first things first. So that that's actually one measure of cost effectiveness, the cost per additional graduate. And it's only per additional graduate that we're trying to use and estimate here, okay? Um, so those are cost effectiveness examples. We have a lot of them on our site. Uh, we've done cost effectiveness in number of areas where we've also done benefit cost analysis, and I'll mention that I think uh, we're the first who have ever done this kind of analysis for social and emotional uh, development, social and emotional interventions. The same is true, uh, I shouldn't say the same is true, in terms of using a rigorous method of cost analysis, uh, Wraparound services, uh, we have fairly rigorous uh, work on that site. Um, okay, uh, so I want to go to benefit cost analysis. I didn't want to develop that whole topic here. We've already focused on cost effectiveness analysis and that's confusing and boring enough. And so um, benefit cost analysis is a measure of return on investment. It's basically the difference between benefits and costs of interventions expressed as a rate of return, 
benefit cost ratio or net present value. Um, it's a measure of social, of the return on a social investment. Um, when we improve, for example, uh, ed educational attainments, there are benefits to the taxpayer who's also paying, broadly speaking, the taxpayer is paying most of the cost of any of our interventions. So what are those benefits? Well, what happens is people with higher educational attainment have better employment uh, records, have higher incomes, and out of that, there are benefits to society and additional tax revenues. There are also reduced costs of services for, these, for populations who get higher educational attainment. Um, and the re most recent studies are causal, so we're not just talking about observational studies, but there are reduced costs of you know, Medicaid, public health programs, public assistance, uh, criminal justice. There are other categories as well. And so when we use um, those criteria for looking at benefits and costs, we find that investments in education, a lot of them, not all of them by any means, do have uh, results where benefits exceed costs. And what we've found is that the, the reason that I've just at, at the tail end here talked about benefit cost analysis is because these have some appeal to funders. If you can show that you've done a, a really complete, and comprehensive and competent study, when benefits are very large relative to cost, it has some influence on those who make funding allocations. And examples that you can find in the literature and just historically are uh, Head Start. Head Start was saved actually by the Perry School results. And the Perry, thank God the Perry School results in study after study through first age 19, age 27, age 40, now they're working on the age 50 data which suffer from the fact that these were very, very impoverished populations. So there are deaths. And so in terms of power tests, there are real challenges as these populations get older, but very rich data in terms of um, life events and life accomplishments for different populations. Uh, and there are now are quite a few early childhood studies that confirm the results uh, that are more sophisticated and with much more substantial data resources that they've used. High school graduation, college graduation. Uh, I wanted to mention one of the college graduations. It's one that we were involved in called ASAP. ASAP is, uh, is associate students, um, no, accelerated students, you know, you get in trouble when you, when you just know initials. Accelerated students for um, associate, associate program, okay? So it's about associate degrees, and as you may know nationally, in urban community colleges, about 12% of the students who start actually get an associate degree, graduate. Uh, the City University of New York was really intent on increasing associate degree graduates, and they put together a wonderful program that makes an awful lot of sense. We don't have time to go into it, but it, it's, it, it's very responsive to student needs. But there were 60% higher costs. Can you imagine saying, oh, we'd like to have this program, it's gonna cost 60% more for full-time equivalent student. Uh, that's not, doesn't sound on the surface like a big sell, you know? But it turns out in a matched group, propensity score matching, done quite well. They doubled the graduates from about 25% that's higher than the national baseline to about 55% within three years. And the actual, if you talk about cost effectiveness, a 60% increase in 
the cost per full-time equivalent student relative to the counterfactual, the standard program, resulted in a reduction in cost per graduate of 6,500. So here's something that was very expensive on the surface, if you only say cost per student, which is not telling you anything about what was accomplished, what, what, whether your goals were achieved. Um, so it's cost effective. But in addition to that, the taxpayer benefits are more than three times the overall cost. And in a pretty convincing way, how do I know it was convincing? Because we had to go before the tight-fisted state legislature, the city university supported by the state and by the city of New York, and by the tight-fisted city council to make the argument that this was worth allocating resources to. And they were persuaded enough, and the ASAP people tell me that, it, that the report that we did on the benefit cost and the cost effectiveness, that funding appropriations increased from 1,000 students initially, 2007 to 2010, to about 20,000 students today, okay? So the, the, these can be effective. Um, let me just move on so we can take some questions. Uh, I just want to finish by saying the cost effectiveness and benefit cost approaches promote educational quality and equity. It's not just a matter of getting some numbers that represent costs. It's how you use those. And they can be used to persuade. They can also be used to choose what appear to be more, more parsimonious programs, but for, for getting same good things. Um, it improves education with better resource allocation. There are more resources for program expansion, which is very positive. The results promote inclusion for those with the least family resources, because that's where we're putting our efforts in terms of using these tools. They promote reductions in costs, and I would argue student loan debt. Um, and cost-benefit results favor increased participation and completion rates at all levels. I mentioned the high school, at the uh, certainly community college, and we believe that you would get uh, similar results for four-year college results. So I have the following obligations for you. Thanks for attending, thanks for coming here to this session. I also want to thank my colleagues, in fact, two of them are right here, Clive Belfield and Brooks Bowden, but also Rob Shand and Patrick McEwen for their valued contributions. You'll see that they're all co-authors of the third edition of our book. And if you want the details so you can see if I'm telling the truth, I encourage you to go to Sage Publications and tell them you want a copy of that book, the one with all those colors on the cover, okay? Thank you so very much, and I'm prepared to try to respond to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, probably the best way to do this is for people just to go up to this microphone. Is there is there one in the back? I can't see very well, but okay. But just go up to the microphone, fire away. If you give a short question, I'll give a short answer. If it's extensive or if it's a declaration, I might not be able to give any answer. Okay. And by the way, feel free to get in touch with us at uh, our, our center because we also try to answer questions there, too. Um, hi, Professor. I have a question. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in economics, so I'm really wondering about how you address some of the issues um, that are related with economics. For instance, when you use this cost-benefit model, how would you address positive externality, right? Because how would you include the positive, ex positive uh, external benefits for the group of people. And also in, in economics, we also have this primary effect and mm -hmm. secondary effect. So I wonder, do you only consider primary effects? And how, if, 
not, then how would you also address secondary effects? So that's my question. Okay, thanks. Um, let, let me answer that very quickly. The, the questions that you ask really get much more into methodology than I would like to get into here. But you can do this at an individual level and say, what's in it for the people who are going to presumably benefit for, and what are their costs? So you can do, and it turns out that in ASAP, uh, the benefit to cost ratio for the individual student is about 12 to one. It's very high in the literature. It's about three and a half to one for society. Why? Pretty obvious. Society's paying most of the cost of this kind of intervention. Uh, but the question that, that you ask, I, I can't go into here without going into very specific cases that you have in mind. And I think we, we do try to address some of that in the book, in the third edition, which just came out this year, by the way. So don't buy the 2001 edition. Definitely don't buy the 1983 edition. Yeah. Hi. Um, I've got a question. The, um, in Illinois, we just changed from the kind of historic resource equalizer model of funding schools to evidence-based funding model where we're looking at the actual cost of effective criteria uh, for fund for the, to improve instruction. Do you see other states kind of moving towards that, looking at actual cost of the, the, the criteria that work? Well, um, which state, by the way? Are you Illinois. Illinois, yeah. Uh, I see a lot of states talking about it. Certainly, that has been tried and is being tried in higher education, uh, where the reimbursements to the universities are predicated on their effectiveness, their success. I think we still have a long way to go to do this in, in an effective way and in an equitable way because schooling is complicated. It's a multi-product activity, so to speak, Mul multiple output product. And f for this reason, uh, almost any time that you set specific measures of performance, you're leaving out others, and often this is an arbitrary decision. We are doing some work on cost utility analysis to try to incorporate these into a utility, a value function for society. And, but the, our work is still early. It's, <laughs> we talk, we've talked about it in all three editions of the book. We've given some lightweight examples. Uh, we've given a lot of uh, theory. Putting it into action is hard for us, and I can imagine it's tremendously challenging for states. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Hank. Mike Kirst, uh, president of the California State Board of Education and professor emeritus at Stanford. And we shared an office to get, uh, next to each other all those years at Stanford. So in my current role, we're seeing a great deal of interest in social-emotional learning. And to me, we're struggling in California to implement Common Core, Next Generation Science. Now, all of a sudden, I'm confronted with all these yeah. calls to add a big social-emotional learning program. So one, what do you, what's your comment on the cost-effectiveness of this? And then if you were in my position uh, and you had to trade these off in some way and some mm -hmm. measure of how much you do on the one side of improving instruction and then social emotional learning. Uh, I'd like your comments on that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let, let me tell you what we've done on it, both the, what, what we feel good about and what we have, what we have to do more. The, the first thing is we chose six different uh, interventions from CASEL, that CASEL, though we're good, and others, others too. CASEL is the Council for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, okay, in Chicago. And it's, it's considered to be the, the leading organization on this topic. And what we did is we did benefit cost studies of all of these but we didn't really compare them with each other. And the reason we didn't compare them with each other is that if you do what we call a benefits map, what are the potential benefits of each of these? From the literature, 
from various studies, what you find is that there are some that have been measured, some that are probably measurable, but they haven't, and then those that are probably not measurable. So we know that our studies of benefit costs, while very favorable to the six particular programs that we studied, and they're available on our website, the, the publication, um, really shouldn't be compared with each other because some of them on the benefits map are missing more categories than others. So that's the first thing. We're not at the point of saying from a, the perspective of the payoff that this is better than this or this is better than this with any, with any certainty. Now the second thing is, you know, there's a lot of um, judgment involved in terms of which SEL dimensions should be emphasized or should be, should be part of the accountability apparatus. And I think we ought to be very respectful of that. I think that we ought to continue to be in a place where this should be good for researchers, educational researchers, studying different dimensions. Now that doesn't mean that some um, organizations haven't drawn conclusions about these. Uh, Aspen Institute has a big endeavor and has a lot of publications now in terms of reviews of literature, in terms of how you should move forward on these. One of the things that's really important in, in, the, in your context is the emphasis is on SEAD, social, emotional, and academic development. That is, these are not independent. Uh, it, you know, if you want to be a good problem solver, you do need some knowledge, some facts, uh, not fake not fake facts, you know, but uh, pretty reasonable ones. Uh, these things work together. You can't talk about academic development, and we all know that, without talking about social and emotional factors that either enhance it or get in the way, okay? So I think we're really in a developmental period and going slowly in terms of accountability requirements is actually very wise. Thanks, Mike. Professor Levin, it was a privilege again, thank you for listening to you. Uh, to give the audience an idea of the vastness of your knowledge, you're also very familiar with the situation in education in the Netherlands and your work for the OECD. And as you know, uh, the position of results in education in the Netherlands uh, went from top three to top five to top ten and now even lower in the OECD rankings. It's still high but it's going down. Mm -hmm. And workers in education now argue that this is the result of at least ten years of severe financial cutbacks. If we would like to find a ground for this assumption where would you advise us to start? What indicators should we look at? I find that a very, very hard question because although I'm familiar with the Netherlands, I've worked over there and uh, worked with colleagues and had students from the Netherlands and have a son who's married to a Dutch wife and his two children even speak uh, some Dutch. Uh, that's not really the same as being able to evaluate that issue. What I would say is we want to be very careful about the interpretations of PISA. And I believe you're, you know, the elephant in the room here is, is PISA. Um, in the States, we have been lambasted for being very mediocre, very much in the mediocre average category among the industrialized nations. And one of the arguments explicit and implicit is we're destroying our labor force. It's the nation at, at risk argument, unilateral disarmament. I would like people to actually go look at the data. If you look at the data, for example, OECD for 2015 in terms of labor productivity, the U.S. is pretty much the highest in the world. You know, Liechtenstein might have a, 
a small edge, you know, that's a weird economy and, and so on and so forth. Hope no one is here from Liechtenstein, you know. <laughs> um, but if we take Korea, Korea has maintained very high yeah. scores on PISA from the very beginning, from the first, 2000, mm -hmm. to the present. The productivity, you know, by, by this time we should have been wiped out productivity-wise by Korea. Um, for the U.S., the, if we just take the number of hours of work and use that to divide our gross domestic product, comes out with $67 an hour. With Korea, it's $40 an hour. Uh, Japan is in that range as well. So there's something strange going on here. Uh, and it's no longer the case where we just invest in a lot of technology and capital and things like this. Anyone who's visited Korea <laughs> will see just amazing results. And, he, and China, uh, where, where I go quite frequently and teach quite frequently, very, very impressive in those parts of the economy. So I think we, we really need a lot more thinking and a, a lot more attention to what are the things that are important in education as opposed to just PISA scores, mm. okay? Thank you. From the U.S. Department of Education, and just a quick question about the benefit costs studies. Yeah. I'm involved in the Title I allocation process, um, and there's different grants going out EFI grants, for example, to the states. Do you think that some type of benefit cost analysis could be applied to the Title I funding? Yeah, if, if we can get agreement on what it is that Title I funding is doing, I think we can. Uh, that's what we did, by the way, in these six uh, social and emotional learning studies. We looked at what they did, what their accomplishments were, and as I mentioned, we made these maps and then estimated the benefits. My presumption is that Title I has a purpose. Now, some of those purposes are political, <laughs> getting into the right congressional districts. Oh, what formula does that require? You know, But I think what we can do is refine that uh, but it would be starting at the beginning as opposed to the, this is the purpose of Title I. These are the measures that you use. Now go do your thing. Okay? Does that answer your question? At least. The, the, the other thing is, you know, what, write out a check for a couple of million dollars and send it to me and I'll give you a much longer answer. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, that, that are earmarked by the funding. And so I, I, I just didn't know whether or not it's a good candidate yeah. for the benefit cost analysis. Well, you know, off the top of my head, I'd say, well, wait a minute. Allegedly, <laughs> it's responsible for re improving equity in terms of results. What is the value of that? And I think we could do something on that, but I don't think it's been done yet. No. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Please. From your earlier statement, it sounded you were a little skeptical about performance-based funding. Um, what you presented here was more of a kind of doing qualita quantitative analysis mm -hmm. for planning and, right. and uh, allocation of resources versus incentivizing Right. institutions. Can you elaborate some more if, sure. if I understood your skepticism sure. to be accurate? Yeah. Well, we've always looked at cost effectiveness and benefit costs, not as something that automatically makes decisions for you. You know, you, you can think in terms of future machine learning and AI and you just put the data in and you get a result and it tells you what decision must be made immediately. We, we don't see it that way. We, we think that decision makers cover a lot of ground 
that you can't put into the interpretation or the use of data. Now, I mean, I'm not arguing that, oh, we don't, shouldn't use it at all, but it's informational that feeds into what a good decision maker should use. Uh, for example, we point out in our book that a, um, an intervention that's a little bit more cost effective than another, but that's unknown territory in terms of implementation, we, we, we really put a lot of weight on implementation, may not necessarily be the best decision. That is one where a school organization has experience and has been successful and has teachers and other educators who are sold, who are, who are, who are advocates, even if, according to our measurements, the cost effectiveness is about 10% less than some other alternative, we would probably suggest that they go with the one that matches up well with, with, with what they've done. So in, in a way, uh, Max Planck expressed this very well in his autobiography. He couldn't understand why quantum mechanics hadn't completely displaced uh, classical physics, you know, where, where there are laws, and the laws tell you, and there's just a mechanical relationship, basically, and now, all of a sudden, um, they become probabilistic, they become based on much smaller, uh, ele uh, much smaller measures, molecules, and then, of course, we get down to atoms, and then subatomic behavior. Uh, he couldn't understand why it wasn't immediately accepted by other physicists. They didn't just drop classical physics. And his final conclusion, he was very disappointed, bitterly disappointed. He said what he didn't realize is that the scientist is an integral part of the scientific apparatus. It's not just a matter of the experiments out here and what they come up with. And I think that that's true here too. And it's, it's a desirable thing. We're not arguing that these results should be mechanical. They've got to take into account other kinds of information. It's another tool, it's another source of information, but we consider it very important information. Okay, thanks. Well, my inclination is to say thank you so much. Really appreciate your being here. <laughs>